um, to help teach us. Go ahead, Dr. Clark. Uh, well, thank you. Appreciate the invitation. And um, I, I am I am going to try and keep this to about 20 to 25 minutes. And I'll go ahead and share my screen here. But um, please feel free to type in any questions. And I do have a couple polls that will uh, will uh, uh, be present during this. And so if you could type in answers there or thoughts, that would be great. And we we thought that to to go through some of the hot tests in 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 this area that we'd we'd uh, present a couple cases and just run through sort of the way we think about them clinically. And so I I am going to um, focus with the esophagus. And what I'll try and do is do um, four quick cases that go through some of the technology which we use in terms of testing, and uh, um, you know just talk about the way that that that. Um, frame care for for um, these patients. The first case is by far um, that 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 will take the most of my time. That's probably seventy five percent of the slides. And then case two, three, and four are all pretty quick. So um, this this patient was one of my favorite you know clinic patients of all times. And a forty six year old uh, who who first came to see me with refractory chest pain. He said the the pain had been increasing within severity in the last year. It was thirteen of ten of its worst, but it was located three centimeters to the right of his uh, mid chest. Um, but it did occur an hour and a half after eating and at night. It had a clear relationship with uh, pepper plus garlic, um, no dysphagia, no heartburn, no, uh, no uh, exercise associated, um, and uh, no cardiac risk factors, negative stress test. He'd had a very extensive workup before he saw me. So he'd had multiple endoscopies with biopsies. He'd had a wireless pH probe, which was done on therapy, which was negative. He had a soft gel manometry, which was normal. He had a technician hide, hide a scan with the idea that perhaps his, um, his right pain was secondary to uh, biliary dyskinesia. Um, uh, that was uh, borderline and was followed by actually a cholecystectomy, which did not improve his symptoms. He was seen by ortho with the idea that this was costochondritis. He was seen by psychiatry with the idea that maybe there was some sort of anxiety component. He was tried on NSAIDs. He was tried on six of the seven commercially available PEPIs without any improvement in symptoms. Past medical history, by ordered, uh, oh, sorry, 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 a bicuspid valve, which was re replaced, anxiety, my migraines, prior GI bleed without a clear cause, um, but you know, pretty healthy besides that. Um, his meds at the time, aspirin, metoprolol, diazepam, buspar. Um, he actually had a pretty interesting social history. It was a he um, actually retired as a professional athlete and worked, worked at that point, point as a corporation. Um, at that point as a CEO, prior smoker who had quit, um, drank alcohol occasionally socially, uh, five cups a day of coffee, um, and, and was, was pretty adamant that, that he drank that throughout the day. He was married with uh, one child who was nine months. Uh, family history was pretty unremarkable at the time, and he looked a good 10 years younger than his age. So the big question why he he came was that his best friend's a gastroenterologist, and patients convinced this is GERD. It's um, wor you know it's worse after food. Um, there are certain triggers such as pepper. His friends convinced that this is all entirely in his head and psychiatric. And so the question that that they asked me to um, try and try and try and uh, work out is you know who's right and uh, what's the next step. So. Question for the group, and feel free to, to text what what you you think of doing here. You know, their big question seeing me was, is this GERD or not? Now, he's had a wireless test on therapy, which didn't show any acid. He's been treated with PPIs now with six separate um, 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 courses without any real change, change in a therapy. So if you were doing something else, would you, you know, consider trying a PPI, let's say the, the last one he hasn't tried. Would you look again with endoscopy? Would you do a wireless test off meds, wireless test on meds, or also pH impedance? I'll give a second if anyone wants to, to uh, type in. Yeah, so 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 C, it sounds like, you know, and, and this this pretty much brings up the question of, how exactly do you make a diagnosis of, of GERD? And there's there's a number of different ways of doing it. And so 
you know, looking at response to anti-secretory therapy is often the first line. But if you look at sensitivity and specificity, it's about 70 and 50 per percent. And, and in his case, he's tried this six times with that improvement. Uh, barium studies are good looking at hernias or other things along those lines. But problem is that the average person will reflux 40 plus times a day. And so if you catch one event in the course of the barium study, it doesn't really quantify. And if you don't see anything, it doesn't mean that they don't go 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 out and have a big meal and then have GERD afterwards. Um, you know, typically endoscopy, we'll see reflux esophagitis in about 10 to 20 percent of uh, those patients that have heartburn based on the study. But most people with GERD will have an upper endoscopy that's normal. In his case, he's had that set, uh, you know, a few times. Uh, capsule endoscopy, I place on the list just because patients ask about it and it's FDA approved. But the data shows that um, sensitivity versus endoscopy is about 70%. Endoscopy is already not that sensitive. And so you're then left with um, doing pH testing, pH impedance testing versus a mucosal integrity. And I'll talk very briefly about this. This is wireless pH Probe, probe, probe testing. The idea is that during endoscopy, you uh, place this catheter down, this probe that's at the bottom fixes against the distal aspect of the esophagus. That'll stay in place for typically about seven days, records about 96 hours, and it'll record the pH every six seconds at that site, site and then it falls off. This is what this looks like in practice. This is me on the left when I had more hair. Um, and this is what you you get with the results. Are you'll you'll get uh, 48 hours or or um, twice that of uh, pH data. And so in this particular image, um, every time that that uh, they have symptoms, there's a red vertical line that comes down. Every time that there's meals, it's yellow. Every time they're sleeping, it's green. And this will essentially give give you a um, um, basically a quantified readout of what the acid time is plus correlation with symptoms. Um, now, the, the downside with doing wireless pH testing and pH testing in general is that you're looking at only acid. And there's increasing um, day, data to show that non-acid GERD can cause symptoms, particularly the atypical symptoms such as cough. And so that uh, brings up impedance, which looks at different parameters looking at flow. And so uh, the, the um, a basic concept with impedance is that you take a voltage, uh, you uh, basically apply this across a ring set. And then if you know what's outside of the ring set and what will close that circuit, it's possible to uh, separate air air versus fluid. And if you have these, these rings throughout a, um, a long, a, a long catheter in the esophagus, it's possible to then separate the movement of air fluid from a uh, baseline of the esophagus. Um, this can be helpful if you're looking at non-acid um, reflux events, or if you're also looking at bolus flow uh, during the um, course of a uh, swallows. Downside with it though, is that it really means going through and looking at this minute by minute throughout a 24 hour span. So in this particular patient, this is someone who's got two episodes of GERD, which are here and you can see white is fluid, black is air, um, mouth is at the top of the screen, stomach is at the bottom. And so you see these white areas coming up right here, which corresponds with fluid coming up. And if you looked at just the pH line, which is this red one, it really doesn't dip. So this can be helpful if you're looking to try and find GERD that's not acid-based. So the downside is that it's catheter-based. And then the, the newest kit that's on the block right now is mucosal impedance. Um, this was just FDA approved last year. And the idea is that you take a balloon with these impedance sensors, place it within the esophagus, and it measures the impedance of the esophageal wall. And based on the pattern that you see, um, it may be helpful in separating GERD versus EOE versus those patients that uh, don't, don't have those. Um, you know, time will tell where this fits in the pathway, but the uh, compelling point about this is that it may be a way to uh, look at injury in the esophagus and inflammation without necessarily doing a 24 plus hour study. So going back towards this patient, so um, he ended up getting a wireless test off meds. Um, he, he had acid about 9% of the time. He had a Demeester score, which, which was high. Um, it turned out that 24 of his 28 episodes of chest pain did correspond with acid. Um, and despite the fact that he said that he never had heartburn ever at any point, he actually recorded it 12 times in the course of the study and it linked entirely with acid. So based on that, we came back and said, well, it, it does look like, like GERD. 
might be playing playing a role and you know likely a prominent role in these symptoms. So why don't we start you on the 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 one acid suppressant med you haven't done yet? We'll do that twice a day and then then a check again. And so we did that for eight weeks and he came back in clinic. He had no change in symptoms whatsoever. So, you know, brings up the next question. What do you do at this point? Do you retry PPI at a higher dose? Do you look with endoscopy? Do you do a wireless test on meds now? Do you do pH impedance? Or do you feel you have enough info at this point to just go straight, straight um, towards doing an operation? And, you know, say we, we had thought about this a bit and figured that this was a good time to look and see at, at this point, pH impedance. And the thought here is that he does have symptoms that correlate with acid, but his symptoms don't improve at all with meds. And that uh, brings up the question, is he symptomatic then with uh, you know, possibly non-acid fluid that's coming up? Is um, he not getting blocked appropriately with the acid, which seems less likely based on his prior workup, or is there something else going on? So uh, you know, this, this is a you know, real life scenario, so I didn't change it to make it sound better. And I'll say this was prior to me being, being here. This was back, back uh, this, this, this case was back in the days back on the East Coast. But um, he had a, uh, we um, talked him through doing a pH impedance study. He was very worried about doing it because he had a young daughter. He was afraid would pull it. He had a lot of work meetings, et cetera. He finally went through it. Um, got through it, but due to a technician error, the study was uh, subsequently erased and we didn't have anything to look at. So um, I called him expecting him to be very upset about this whole thing. He actually just started laughing and said, let's do it again. So went through again. And on his second one, he had 101 events, uh, complete acid suppression, but he had strong symptom correlation between the non-acid uh, GERD plus chest pain. So, you know, what now? And if you step back and, and look at this, this kind of brings up the, the question of, uh, of, of how exactly we, we look at heartburn. And so if you think about it with erosive esophagitis and such, it tends to be much more acid-based. Once you start going to more of the atypical symptoms, the high and more of kind of the hypersensitivity, you cross that line where it's less likely to be acid involved. And if you take a look at, at this on the left, which is the Rome 4 approach, you can see that he's actually got this, this bit of an overlap here where he's got chest pain instead of heartburn, but it's essentially the same thing. We looked off off um, meds and he has proven GERD based upon his wireless pH, which puts him in this category. He then went on meds, symptoms continued. He had pH impedance, his acid at that point is normal. So what he's got essentially is he's got reflux hypersensitivity with GERD. And so this patient was then, uh, we, we then placed him upon a um, SNRI uh, kept him upon a PPI once a day. He tried to uh, get better sleep. He minimized coffee. Um, he at first had wanted to um, go ahead with an operation, but gradually felt better in the course of 12 weeks out. Um, last time I saw him was was about three uh, weeks after the, or, or years post that, and he actually was doing well and off meds at that point. And I think in his particular case, um, I, I think that his anxiety about the whole process and his struggle to find an answer had actually revved up his, his whole sensitivity in the gastrointestinal tract. And once he knew that this, this, this was GERD as a prime component, um, he, he seemed to do a lot better afterwards. So uh, let me jump on to case two, and every case will get shorter. So um, this case is um, 52. He's um, um, he is actually a radiologist who comes into clinic because of uh, dysphagia to solid food. And he's got a subjective set of obstructions at the, the bottom of his chest, uh, two-year duration with a progressive increase in symptoms. It's intermittent, so he does have days that seem pretty good. He doesn't have any issues with liquid, no regurgitation, no chest pain, no weight loss. And he notes that he's had baseline heartburn for decades prior to symptom onset, but his heartburn actually disappeared a year or two ago. So um, past medical history notable for, um, for past history of asthma in childhood, which he grew out of. He's on Singulair, uh, plus also a PPI, drinks one cup a day of coffee, two um, glasses of wine a night, otherwise pretty unremarkable. 
And before he saw me in, 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 in um, clinic, he had a barium esophagram and he did his own study and said it was normal. Um, he also had two endoscopies that were done twice, um, both of which were read as normal. And he had been stretched to um, two centimeters without any improvement in symptoms. He had biopsies taken that did not show any EOs. And so the question is what, what next? And, you know, when, when he had done biopsies, they, they, they were kind of placed in one area. It wasn't really segmental. It wasn't clear the amount which were done. So you could make a case to repeat endoscopy and take biopsies proximal and distal with the idea that he's got solid food dysphagia. He has a history of asthma. Um, so, so you, you are thinking of EOE and it can be somewhat patchy. Do we do a barium esophagram at a different facility with a tablet? His didn't have one, but given that he works as a radiologist, I, I wasn't going to, to make him do that again elsewhere when he had done his own study. Do we take a look with a manometry? Do we look with flip or do we test looking at GERD? And so, um, you know, we, we, we weighed the pros and cons of this. I think in this case, both C and, and D are all, you know, pretty reasonable options. Uh, but, but we ended up going ahead with a manometry. And this was me uh, getting a manometry in a pH impedance study back in 2006. And uh, this is what it should look like. And so at the top of the screen is the mouth, the bottom is the stomach, pressure corresponds with color. And so the higher the pressure, the more red, lower the pressure, more blue. What you're seeing here is you, you basically look at the upper sphincter here, this opens and you see a little increase in bolus pressure with the fluid coming down. And then typically you have this nice stripping wave that comes down here, more, more prominent within the distal two thirds. And then the lower sphincter, you know, it has a baseline pressure of about 20 approximately, and then it opens, it'll close back up again. And so this is what you should see with someone who has swallowing that, 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 um, that looks appropriate. And this is what we saw in his case. And you can see here that, you know, that prior baseline stripping wave, which is this nice, nice diagonal wave, you, you don't see it all here. You're just seeing this isobaric contour coming down. And, and if you take a look at the lower soft sphincter pressure, where, whereas on this patient who's normal, you can see it opens appropriately. On this patient, you, you can see it stays pretty clear as a green line. It, it does briefly change here, but that's after he's swallowed and after he's had pressure. So this is a case of uh, someone with achalasia. And if you're on the, the, the boards, this is one of those, those, those prime examples that they'll often ask. And so you know, what next? And um, someone with achalasia, you know, I think there's there's seven possible options, but I think if you look at that, there's three good options. And if we um, take a look at, um, at subsets with manometry, he has what's called subset two, meaning that he has pressurization within the esophagus. And if you look at subset two, that's the one that really seems to uh, best respond to everything. So I think in his particular case, all three of these are actually good options based on personal preference and local expertise. So uh, we ended up talking about um, at that point, what options to do. He opted to go with the Heller. Um, I'll say that um, this case was in 2012. And when I'd been back on the East Coast, the first poem that we had done at that point was 2013. So I think if he were being seen now, whether it would be poem versus Heller or dilation, I think they're all pretty valid options, but he had opted at that point with Heller and was doing great. Um, and then in the, the final two minutes, I'm gonna do two quick bullet cases here. So I'll talk very quickly about flip. And the idea here is that We've talked a little bit about impedance for looking at flow and how that that can be helpful in GERD as 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 uh, well as looking at swallowing. Um, in about 2005, there was a group of investigators in uh, Germany and Ireland who got together and realized that if you took these channels and um, took these catheters with impedance, that through uh, Ohm's law. If you knew essentially the uh, conductance of the fluid around it, the distance between the rings, the voltage that was applied, that you could take a balloon and then essentially make a contour map of what's there. And so they ended up at that point, point, point forming flip. If you then combine that with a pressure sensor that's inside, it's possible to look at compliance as well as to sensibility. 
And so in practice, what this shows is something like this, where you can place this ac across any area in the gastrointestinal tract, and you get essentially a map um, of what the diameter is that's on your right-hand side. And then if you take this pressure at the bottom, you then can also look, look, look at a distensibility and um, compliance. So nice about this versus manometry is that you can do it during real time during endoscopy. So if you're seeing someone who comes in because of swallowing issues and you don't want to necessarily let them wake up, you know, do a manometry, bring them back with an upper endoscopy afterwards, you could do this at the same time and it takes about roughly five minutes. So uh, two very quick cases with this. Um, first one, this is a man who, who, who was a 30 and was sent to me because of problems swallowing. Had three separate endoscopies. He'd been, um, he'd, he'd been stretched twice with very minimal improvement in symptoms. He had an esophagram that showed spasm. He'd had two separate manometries that were reported to show spasm, but the LES function looked okay. And the, the question that, that they had was, um, you know, could this be a variant of achalasia? And would uh, um, would a flip help 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 in terms of that? So what you're seeing here is you're seeing um, the the um, same balloon within the same area of the esophagus. 20 cc's of fluid on the left hand side, 50s uh, on uh, on 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 the right hand side, and you can see that when there's 20 cc's in, there's a baseline diameter minimum of about 5.5 and you've got a pressure of 22. You go from there to 50, your baseline stays about the same. You go from 5.5 to 5.4, but you can see your pressure shoots up. And what's probably happening is when he gets distension with the balloon, he then um, at that point triggers contractions. He's got pretty Im impressive shortening of the esophagus. And so, so the sphincter's at that point pulling up. And so probably when they had read the manometry, what probably happened was that his sphincter was pulling up from the reference uh, frame and, 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 and that had been why it was read as looking like spasm, but, but not, not at that point a variant of achalasia. But based on this, we could say that this is not opening as distensibility is low. This person went for POEM and did very, very well. Um, and then the last case that I have here is a 38 year old who was sent me to, who was sent because of dysphagia, and he has a known history of EOE, but what was kind of interesting was um, no stricture seen on any of his barium or endoscopy studies. He'd, he'd been um, stretched without any improvement in symptoms, um, and he had, no signs, he had no signs of inflammation with any of his biopsies. So the question was, you know, if there's no stricture, there's no inflammation, he's not better with stretching, why is he symptomatic? And so we ended up doing a flip study and we put this balloon within the body of the esophagus. Same thing, this is uh, 20 cc's of fluid. This is 30 on, on the right. You know, if you look, he's got a baseline diameter of about 15, which doesn't seem all that low, but you can see that when um, we inflate this, just look at the pressure increase here. And uh, for reference, the pressure in the esophagus typically doesn't go above about 30 or so. So what's pretty much happening is he's got this lead pipe esophagus where uh, typically if you swallow, the esophagus opens, you, you get um, dilation, food goes down, and then you've got this constricting wave afterwards. In his case, the esophagus doesn't expand. He's got just this scarring in that area. And so he's feeling things based on that. Now we don't really have a way to take away the fibrosis, so we this this didn't necessarily lend lend itself towards new therapies. But we could tell them that this wasn't an issue of sensation; there was a basis for it, and this saved him from going on and doing a whole bunch of you know SSRIs and TCAs and things along those lines. Um, so I'll end here and I'll just make make a quick pitch for a CME course, which we are doing uh, 13th to 15th of April. Uh, it's in person as well as Zoom. It's at the Redwood City site. Uh, we uh, do have a wine and cheese hour as well with that. So um, please think of joining us and I will um, stop here and thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Um, so we'll have Dr. Pimentel share and all the questions will be afterwards. Can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. So uh, it's great to be on the same podium, so to speak, uh, Zoom, Zoom podium with uh, Dr. Clark. So that was great. Um, and, and so I've 
taking a different twist. Obviously, it's a very different part of the motility slash microbiome part of the world, looking at SIBO, IBS, and the microbiome in the context of cases. And I do have some disclosures, which I think are part of the CME uh, documents as well. <clears throat> and uh, I'm part of the MASS program at CEDARS, which is really trying to determine the microbiome as it relates to both motility disorders in cause and effect. So if you have a motility problem, it will change the microbiome or the microbiome is changing the motility of the gut and, and other disorders. Um, but I'm going to start with, I'm going to have, I have two cases and I'll try and finish these up in 20 to 25 minutes, but two very interesting cases and maybe, or perhaps not too obvious, but uh, I think you'll find them interesting and relatable uh, for some young people anyways. This is a 30-year-old male with no past medical history, so not, not as complicated as uh, some of the cases with the esophagus because they tend to be older. One year ago, before I saw him, <clears throat> uh, while his neighbors were out on an extended vacation, he decided to jump the fence and swim in their pool, and the pool was murky. So, um, and this is a true story, and it's quite funny, and the neighbors never knew, even to this day, I didn't disclose this information. 24 hours later, he had nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and this lasted about four days. And although he was dehydrated and felt quite unwell, he did not seek medical attention. He seemed to recover initially, but then over the following weeks, he began to have diarrhea intermittently and increased postprandial bloating. And at times, there was abdominal pain relieved by defecation. So his meds are NSAIDs for intermittent headache that he usually takes, occasional marijuana use, and he has a cousin with Crohn's disease. So I know this is not an open forum, but, but uh, basically this potentially is a red herring or could be important. And so the initial thoughts is what would you do next? And I always love the first statement on the second slide is seen by an outside GI. I feel bad saying they're an outside GI because I don't know what that means, uh, outside of what? Uh, but, uh, but basically somebody in the community who had seen the patient they did an upper endoscopy and colonoscopy and biopsies, and that was negative. They did a CM, CBC, CMP, celiac, lipase, stool elastase, all negative, unrevealing, and they, of course, did stool testing. But this is now many months after the initial um, in, encounter with the dirty pool, and so uh, there weren't any um, pathogens that they were able to detect at this time. And then they did a CT of the abdomen. So if you add all this up, probably about... Fifteen to twenty thousand dollars worth of workup, all negative, and so he was treated with antidiarrheals, and then on the premise that he had irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, eloxadiline was tried, and really wasn't very effective, and so he ended up um, in, our, in our clinic. Um, so because bloating and diarrhea were still breaking through. So what I wanted to sort of touch on here is this notion of post-infectious IBS, and I think you probably all came to a similar conclusion, but I think it's worth highlighting this paper from Clem in 2017, which this is the meta-analysis the, the meta of post-infectious IBS, and if this doesn't make you scared traveling, I don't know what does, but if 100 people get food poisoning, 11% come back with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. If you go to Southeast Asia, your chance of food poisoning is almost 80% if you're not careful. So, uh, you know, good luck. But one in, one in nine patients who experience food poisoning get IBS. So the importance of this finding or, or this relationship in these very well done prospective studies that qualify for this meta-analysis is that really food poisoning causes IBS. But the, but the problem is we don't know how many people with IBS started from food poisoning? So if you took 100 consecutive patients in your clinic with IBSD, uh, because one of the points to be made here is that food poisoning really leads to IBSD, not necessarily C. It's much more uncommon. But is if you had 100 consecutive D patients in your clinic, how many emanated from food poisoning? Well, they've had IBSD for 10 years, and they had D at the beginning with their food poisoning, and they don't remember that it was food poisoning because they didn't put two and two together. Uh, sometimes you remember because you jump over your neighbor's fence and go in the pool and it becomes a very notable event in your life, but, but often it isn't. Um, but what we did in 2012, which was an interest, is Eric Shaw, who is, uh, is uh, the motility director at Dartmouth now, um, he said, well, let's take a math model and see if we put 300 million people in the United States, actually 307 million, if you look on this slide, and he says, they're all normal. 
and then overlay CDC uh, rates of gastroenteritis and put up the meta-analyses that we know about food poisoning and how some people get better even though they get IBS, et cetera, et cetera. And where would we reach steady state? So these 307 million living in the United States would reach steady state at around 10 years. And 9.1% of the entire 307 million people would now have irritable bowel syndrome based on what we knew at the time. And so it's possible that post-infectious IBS makes up a lot of IBS, uh, but the true question is unknown because it's not been followed in that way. So um, what we wanna know is, could food poisoning lead to changes in bacteria and particularly bacterial overgrowth? And this is something that pertains to how he was treated. And of course we know rifaximin is very, uh, uh, very important treatment for IBS. And this goes back to 2008, this is an animal study these rats got Campylobacter jejuni, these rats didn't, and the rats who got Campylobacter jejuni spent three months recovering from it, uh, doing okay, but they were not okay. They were having changes in their stool function and then quantitative PCR of their bowel. And 27% of the rats who got exposed to Campylobacter now had alterations in their small bowel bacteria, and you can call that small intestinal overgrowth. And the rats who got Campylobacter who now have SIBO, 83% of them now have altered stool form. So not only did they get Campylobacter, the ones that got SIBO from Campylobacter have altered stool form. So this is really one of the first animal models of post-infectious IBS using the bug we now know is the most important for post-infectious IBS in humans. Uh, and so this was an opportunity to study things further. Now fast forward to 2022. Does Campylobacter cause IBS? This is not Cox postulates. This is the Bradford Hill criteria, much more rigorous. And basically it meets all the criteria for uh, to a greater and lesser extent, but every box is checked pretty much that Campylobacter causes IBS. And so it's a very important uh, pathogen in, and the most number one cause of food poisoning in the US. So we work on this model now for post-infectious IBS that food poisoning and a toxin on food poisoning called CDTB leads to autoimmunity, a change in gut nerve function, bacterial buildup as a result of the change in the motor activity of the gut, specifically reduced migrating motor complexes, and therefore rifaximin is effective in IBS. And I'm not going to go through all the details of the evidence for this, but um, you know that's, a, that's for another time. But the point is, this is what we believe is the path in post-infectious IBS now. And one toxin is related to this, and that's CDTB. And we actually gave CDTB toxin to rats just as an injection in their skin of their back, and they developed antibodies to CDTB, and they developed antibodies to themselves, to vinculin. And this development is what leads to the motor dysfunction of the gut because this form of vinculin is what helps DMPICCs, the interstitial cells of Cajal, to migrate and adhere to one another. But if you get CDTB toxin from food poisoning, specifically the Campylobacter CDTB, you get overgrowth in the duodenum and the ileum in these rats. So, uh, just a little bit on vinculin. These are uh, cells in our lab, and you can see the red is vinculin, and the green is actin. So they're like little motors at the end of actin to help cells connect to each other. Uh, this was uh, published in Pathogens and Disease, looking at the, 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 how post-infectious IBS occurs. You have a nice, beautiful microflora, all sorts of different colors, shapes, and sizes of beautiful microbes you're supposed to have. You then get food poisoning with Campylobacter, the CDTB toxin you get exposure to, you form antibodies to CDTB, which you see here, and you later, as an autoimmune process, get uh, antibodies to vinculin. The muscular function of the gut neuromuscular apparatus changes, and then you get a buildup of bad players like uh, E. coli, Klebsiella, which are not meant to be high in this way, and then you get this, this uh, antibiotic responsive disease. So back to the case using, using that um, example. So his anti-CDTB was 2.5 with upper limit being 1.56 to 1.6. So he was clearly abnormal. And so he was identified as post-infectious IBS. 
breath test was positive for hydrogen, which again follows the path that we described in the last few slides. And he was treated with rifaximin. He did very, very well. But he never developed autoimmunity. He never developed antivinculin, and he just stayed anti-CDTB positive. He was relapsing, as we see with rifaximin. People come and go. The, the, the symptoms relapse, and then he repeats the rifaximin again, and then it relapsed four to six months later, and you repeat the rifaximin again. And he kept responding, and for that reason, kept doing well-ish, uh, except for the re relapses. But what was most interesting with this case is we did a follow-up CDTB, still abnormal during these relapsing episodes. But then he disappeared for 18 months and he said he's had no relapse for a year. He feels absolutely perfect. He's taking no medication whatsoever and he's having absolutely normal bowel movements. So we repeated the anti-CDTB and it was back to normal. And we see this, it's sort of like your vaccine for, uh, for COVID. You know, when you first get it and then you get the booster, you have elevated antibodies, but then over time, the antibodies wane, as long as you don't get the autoimmunity. And that was, this is an example of the anti-CDTB being positive, but the patient, for whatever reasons, genetics or otherwise, does not get the autoimmunity, and he becomes normal. And I love this case because when I see these patients in my clinic, I can guide them that don't get food poisoning again, of course, but... Uh, you know, you could, or you could be one of those that gets better with time. And we see that in the, in all the studies, um, for example, the um, Walkerton outbreak in Canada and, and other outbreaks, when you look at five or eight years down the road for some, most patients, I would say half, uh, their IBS gradually disappears. The other half, it doesn't, it stays forever. And so uh, perhaps this is an explanation, but it's an interesting case. Um, and he's still to this date, uh, I think I saw him last about a year and a half, two years ago, and still no, no recurrence. But you got to be careful not to get food poisoning again. The second case is another exotic but interesting case. This is a 22-year-old female, we actually published this case, uh, presents with bloating, abdominal pain, and severe constipation. But she was not always like this. Uh, this is a recent development. So she has a history of recurrent sinusitis and asthma in the setting of IgA deficiency. And um, it's moving uh, all your lovely faces out of the way of the screen for me here. Um, and no other GI related complaints until recently. But she's been taking multiple rounds of antibiotics over the last two years because of recurrent sinusitis. And she developed severe diarrhea at one point during these antibiotics. Colonoscopy and stool testing both confirmed C. diff uh, infection. So she was treated with multiple rounds of therapy that includes metronidazole and vancomycin at the time. Uh, this is before fidaxomycin uh, was approved. So this is a couple of years back, uh, but no help. So as you know, what happens when the antibiotic still doesn't work, her GI recommended fecal microbial transplant. And she decided her brother-in-law was the best donor. I don't know how you decide your brother-in-law is the best fecal donor, but that's for another lecture, probably a one-hour lecture. Um, and so the CDI resolved, but now she has severe symptoms of bloating, abdominal pain, and severe constipation, where she doesn't go for five or six days at a time. So what is the diagnosis? Well, I'm going to tell you what the diagnosis is, and then I'm going to walk you through some interest, an interesting paper we just published, which I think has a lot of relevance to this. So we did some investigating, and this was part of the case report, is that we tested her, and she had methane on her breath test. Methane causes constipation. It turns out she wasn't methane before because they had done a breath test when she was having diarrhea, which I didn't reveal to you. Uh, before the di diagnosis of C. diff. Her brother-in-law, however, had a ton of methane in his stool, and that was transplanted to her. And this case actually changed the way open biome screened their stool because if you transfer for methanogens in high numbers to a recipient, you can actually transfer severe constipation, abdominal pain, and bloating. And that's what happened in this case. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about IBS and the microtypes that occur 
uh, on the basis of this study was just published uh, over a month ago. So this was an interesting uh, two studies where we took really rigorous FDA kind of studies where you have to have a very uh, accurate diagnosis of IBSD and another study where it's an IBSC enrollment. We didn't care about the drugs, we just wanted the baseline data. In both trials, there was microbiome assessment, breath testing, and of course, the phenotype of D or, or C. And when breath testing was done in this trial, methane, of course, some of the constipated patients had methane as expected, and this is this group. What was interesting here is that of all the D patients, none of them had methane. So methane was not characteristic of D at all. Not even, not even one patient had methane on their breath test. Um, and so that, that was interesting. Now it's a 45 patient D study and a 109, I think, patient C study. So um, small-ish, 45 patients, but still no methane. When you look at hydrogen though, you can see that in IBS, D, which is the blue, there's more hydrogen, but there's a couple of things to note here is that this is a hydrogen at 90 minutes and on average it's above 20 and 20 is the cutoff for overgrowth by the North American consensus. So on average, and this was not a, a, a study that was selecting SIBO, it was selecting DIBS, and yet the average patient with D had uh, met the criteria for SIBO. What's interesting is if you had constipation but no methane, you're here, which is below the threshold or normal. But if you're a constipated patient with methane, your hydrogen's low. And I'll show you what that means later is because the methane's eating the hydrogen to make methane, which uh, is sort of expected, but it's good to see it in this study. And then hydrogen sulfide is elevated in IBSD. So this is the third gas and a very important new development in uh, breath testing. Then we went to the metabolomics. So the red is the C side, the green is the D side, and I'm not going to let you look at all these words because they're, they're tiny, but to, to summarize, the characteristic metabolic pathways that are elevated in C based on the microbiome were all about methane production as a discriminator from IBSD. And on the D side, it's sulfate reducing pathways that discriminated D from C. So that hydrogen sulfide appears to be a very important determinant of D. And so this allowed us in this paper to really characterize for the first time in very uh, deep sequencing that IBS is divided into three microtypes. There's the methanogen driven microtype, and we now know who is responsible for that. That's methanobrevibacter. There is the hydrogen microtype when the hydrogen donors are usually E. coli and Klebsiella in the small bowel. And then there's the sulfate reducing bacteria, which are Fusobacterium and desulfovibrio. So now we know the cast of characters that are responsible for the three different types of IBS. And the hydrogen sulfide is really driving the di diarrhea uh, side of it. And of course, breath testing, there are now consensus statements from North America, which is, it was in 2018, 2021 is the second consensus statement from Europe. And the Asia Pacific statement just came out just a couple of months ago, and they all say the same thing that they mostly agree about the criteria for SIBO mostly agree about how to do breath testing and mostly agree that SIBO and IBS are interrelated so these experts in small bowel microbiome and SIBO uh, basically all concur. So it sort of works like this. You have hydrogen production in the gastrointestinal tract when you have overgrowth. E. coli and Klebsiella are the two main characters, but they don't correlate with symptoms. So you could have a lot of hydrogen, but it doesn't correlate with symptoms. You are, if you're positive, you have symptoms. If you're very positive, it doesn't mean you have more symptoms because the hydrogen is used as fuel for methanogens to make methane. And the more methane you have, the more constipation you have. And now we're learning that the more hydrogen sulfide you produce up here, the more diarrhea. But I want to look at, want to look at the stoichiometry, four hydrogens to make one methane. And it's important to know that because that's why when you're methane positive, your hydrogen is lower. So if you didn't measure methane and you only measured hydrogen, you can't rely on your hydrogen measurements on the breath test. Up here, it's five hydrogens to make one hydrogen sulfide. So it's important to know all three. So uh, to summarize this part, basically E. coli, 
see Jejuni, Shigella, they all have salmonella, they have one, one toxin in common, and this leads to a cascade leading to a change in the microbiome. So post-infectious IBS really is an interesting uh, new and evolving development in IBS. So I'll stop there just in time for the 10 minutes of Q&A we were, we were hoping to. Thank you both. Those were very informative. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to either say it out loud or in the chat. Um, one question was for Dr. Clark, um, mostly because your case had mentioned the PPI um, for one of the patients. And I know different PPIs have different potency and you know duration, things of that sort. Do you yourself have sort of like an algorithm of which one you prescribe first? And if that doesn't work, which one to go to next? Yeah, yeah, well, it's a great question. So there's uh, there's pro, pros, pros and cons of all of these, and they they've got slightly different features. So, um, you know, if you look at the relative um, strength of all of them, there was, there was a paper in clinical gastroenterology a few years ago where they compared everything to a meprazole uh, uh, twenty, and the weakest one in that study was pantoprazole. Um, which is probably the least powerful of all seven, which are out. But the flip side is that it may be a little more GI specific and it's because it has a long half-life, it is once a day and it's typically covered well with insurance companies. So oftentimes pantoprazole versus omeprazole are the ones that I'll start with because it's always covered with insurance and they're you know, pretty readily available. Um, if I go on from that standpoint, Dexlin, Soprazole and Esomeprazole, tend to be the two which are the most powerful because they're they're uh, next generation and so they're they're just the um, active enantiomers which are present so a little bit cleaner and you know probably twice as strong um, but the downside of that is that if you are looking at more relative um, strength and long-term risks and things along those lines there there is a thought that 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 uh, more powerful is not always better necessarily um but but they they seem to be the most potent of the ones which are out there um the other ones rubeprazole is kind of an interesting one it's um the most commonly prescribed one in india um and it, it does appear to have the uh, of of all of them the fastest rate of onset so sometimes if if i have some someone that i don't think will take it every day or i don't think the pre pre meals work work as well um or or they've tried other ones without much benefit that may be one i try because it's a little bit uh, different biochemically than the other ones great thanks and along the same kind of lines are there any preference for tcas when you first start off a patient I mean, I, I I personally don't, you know. I think that the uh, next generation ones of 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 um, of basically disipramine or nortriptyline, I I I think are 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 probably better options just because there's there's less of the um, cholinergic effects, the anticholinergic. But um, sometimes because a lot of the uh, the date itself is with amitriptyline with vomiting specifically, sometimes I'll 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 use that specifically if I want to follow the papers. But I I don't have a strong preference of those four. I'm curious if Mark does though. Oh, you're on mute. I was looking at the question and trying to pull up, pull up a slide to answer the question, and I wasn't paying attention to what you said, John. So I'll agree with you. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, feel free. Uh, the question was, what are your thoughts on GI mapping, and do you do jejunal aspiration? Sorry, John. I, was, I literally was pulling up the slide. So um, let me just put that up. So this is a paper that we published now a few years back where we actually uh, map the small bowel. So we do this as part of what's called the reimagined study, and we have over 700 patients now where we do duodenal aspirate. But if we're doing double balloon with no colonoscopy, we'll get duodenum, jejunum, and FD, which is called furthest distance. So it could be ileum, might not be. And, and we do full sequencing. And this is at the family level of bacteria. We have it all the way down to the genus level, but it looks the same. And so we use a double lumen catheter that's capped, so it's presumably sterile once you pull the cap off and put the inner lumen out. And, uh, and we actually see that the duodenum, jejunum, and furthest distance don't look that much different, but stool is totally different. And the point of this is not to highlight the small bowel, but to highlight the fact that if you do all these 
stool tests that characterize the microbiome, quote unquote, of your gut, uh, and you just look at stool, you have no idea. It doesn't represent anything that's going on in the small bowel. And even if you break down the families, the genera within these families, even if it's the same family in the stool, are totally different. So it's literally like another planet in the small bowel, and, and so it's important to understand that. So that was, I was hopefully I've answered your question. Dr. Pimento, uh, thanks for the awesome slides. I mean, I think that you have mentioned a couple of cool tests, like the anti -C -C uh, TB as well as anti vinsulin and for like for, for fellowships who don't really already spell smart tests and also hydrogen um, breath tests as well, where we use empirically treat for rifaximin. Um, I guess in terms of if the rifaximin doesn't work, do you does does the does the user rifaximin alter the results of those tests? If well, we, you know, or did, I, I guess do you prefer to for us to test it beforehand? So it really depends. I mean, remember, rifaximin is pretty good. It's about forty four percent likely to be effective. But in a study that Dr. Rezai published using the target three data, if your breath test was positive, I'm not talking about any breath test with hydrogen sulfide. I do have conflicts in, in those companies because I helped develop some of those things. So I just, it's on my conflict slide. But if you just did regular breath testing, hydrogen breath test, if it's positive, you're more likely to respond to rifaximin. So it's about 56%. And if the breath test becomes negative because of rifaximin, it's 76% likely will respond to rifaximin. So the point of that is that the microbiome markers, whatever you're going to use, do predict that you're going to more likely, if you have a microbiome problem, you're more likely to respond to rifaximin. So I think that's the point we're trying to make is how does rifaximin work? And we, we now sort of know this more. We have a few papers that are coming out this year that really go even further into it to show exactly how rifaximin works, where it works, why it fails, in some patients because the bugs are hidden in the mucus and 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 all sorts of more interesting angles to this that that you'll hear about this year i guess if all the, the questions I, I feel like sometimes when patients respond and they have these recurrent episodes how i guess in your practice how often do you retreat them and what's the duration and sort of what's the period in between yeah, so uh, normally my first time I treat the patient, breath test, no breath test, doesn't matter if they respond. And the, that's the other thing. If you give a patient rifaximin and they respond 80%, you don't need a breath test at all. I mean, because there's just no point. You don't have to confirm eradication. Don't waste the money. It's, it's, it's not necessary. But the patients who relapse very frequently, you have to be careful. Because remember, yes, IBS is associated with SIBO but so is an adhesion, so is a cancer of the small bowel, because anything that causes stasis of the bowel can cause overgrowth. And, and uh, you know, we've seen pancreatic cancers, we've seen uh, cirrhosis and other things that are traditional causes of SIBO that the doctor just didn't think of because they thought it was just plain old IBS. So don't close your eyes, but so if a patient relapses very quickly, you need to think about what the cause is and address the cause if in case there is something more more nefarious going on. But on average, if, if, if it's just a patient who responds, usually it's three to six months before they relapse. There are some patients that go two years before relapse, and so it just depends. Thank you. Any other questions? Looks like uh, not. So thank you guys so much for your time and for speaking. We learned a lot. Oh, there is a question. What do you, oh, okay. What do you do with the positive breath test who does not respond to antibiotics? Uh, you're on mute. So the fact you gave rifaximin and neomycin, I presume you mean it was methane, whoever answered that question. Is that right? Okay. Yes, it was. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, methane is a little bit more tricky. I would say our clinic has more methane people now in it and constipated patients than diarrhea patients, mostly because the community has been giving rifaximin pretty you know, routinely now compared to 10 years ago. Uh, and so we're working hard to develop things that could be better for, for the methane group. But you're kind of stuck if rifaximin and neomycin doesn't work. And the other thing you're stuck about is neomycin no longer exists in the US because the final generic company stop making neomycin. So I do use an alternative, which is 
this is a double blind study, neomycin and rifaximin, so it's good evidence. We don't have as good evidence, except I have anecdotal evidence that rifaximin with metronidazole is as good as neomycin, so I do sub that in. So you could try that. Uh, short of that, it's really just managing the constipation because you'd have to go into more um, natural products and other things that don't have a lot as much evidence. So, uh, but uh, stay tuned. There's more coming. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for the clock.